There were actually two miracle babies in Smallville that year. You see, Martha Kent, who had nearly carried a baby to turn, lost her kid when a drunk driver T-boned her and her husband while they were driving home from a town hall meeting in Smallville. It was one of the worst accidents in Smallville's history. Almost the entire town showed up at Kent Farm to offer support. Now, of course, chief among those supporting them were their neighbors, the Rosses, who had actually never been close with the Kents. They didn't even like them. It's not that they're different politically, but they're different culturally. They're different types of people. The Kents were educated. They were city folk who lived in Smallville. They were well-traveled. They were people who had been all over the United States and the world together during their whirlwind, hippie, romantic te first 10 years of their relationship. These weren't your average Smallville folks. But when you talk about Smallville, your average Smallville folks were actually kind of incredible. This town is very isolated in Kansas. It's over 100 miles from the nearest town, which means you have to drive like six hours to get to Smallville and six hours to get out. So the people from the town don't often leave the town, but when they do, they go all over before they come back. The Rosses had never left town. The Rosses didn't think of the world that way. You know, the Ross farm was one of the first farms in Smallville. So the Rosses kind of were one of the richer families in town. They would host weddings at their barn. They would, you know, sort of flex all the time, except for they would flex usually in ways that were too John and Martha Kent, kind of like tacky. They had a room with leopard print wallpaper. The Rosses had an idea of what was cool and fancy, and it was very different from the Kents. Because the Kents, you know, when they moved back to Smallville, they had this idea of raising a kid and buying a dog. And they were just going to have this beautiful final chapter where they go back to the farm Martha's father built and they, they finish it all off. You know, they, they really, they, they have the life that you hear about in the movies. And then the truck plowed into the side of the car. Martha's stomach was crushed. Four of her ribs were broken. The baby was miscarried there in the car, in front of John. And he had a tremendous amount of trauma from it. The, uh, the guy who hit them later committed suicide, and it looked like things were going pretty bad for the Kents. Now, when I say the Rosses were like Smallville people, I'm not saying they're like Hicks. You know, Pete Ross's father is a successful farmer, and Pete Ross's mother, Abigail Ross, is actually a judge in the town who retired by the time she got pregnant. She actually got pregnant right around the same time that Martha Kent got pregnant. So when Martha lost the baby six months in, there was now this like weird dynamic where they had kind of formed a friendship about both being pregnant at the same time. But now Martha was like more and more into painkillers and antidepressants and alcohol and going to a dark place. Martha had kind of visited a little bit in her early 20s when she was living in Chicago. Martha was kind of losing it and going back to the, why did I come back to Smallville? I left Smallville because I wanted a bigger life and then I brought John back to this tiny world and we are destroyed. So their marriage sort of really started fraying, but then they had a talk where John basically said, no matter what happens, we're doing this together. So we leave the farm, we leave Smallville, we stay, no matter what, we're doing it together. And they decided no matter what to stay together. And that bought them a couple of weeks. And then the sky lit on fire and something blew up their barn. On the night of the Starfall, June 5th, uh, it, it was crazy. It literally looked like the sky turned into green fire and then drops fell out of it. People talked a lot about what this could be. Space debris, a falling satellite, a military test, maybe aliens. But at the end of the day, most of what fell was just radioactive metal and nothing else. At least that was all anyone else found. Clark Kent, the infant that fell from the stars, lived in the Kent's house in secret for over a month while John and Martha faked an adoption certificate, faked a birth certificate, and then proceeded to enter him into small town life as though they had adopted a child. Now you have to keep in mind, this kid came down in a pod in a UFO. And it was not like, oh, no one saw that the Kent farm blew up, okay? People saw that, everyone knows. In Smallville, the idea that Clark Kent was some sort of angel, alien, or government experiment 
was basically an unspoken secret amongst the town. Everyone had sympathized with the Kents so intensely when they lost their baby that it really did feel like divine intervention, and even the town's biggest cynics couldn't deny that this seemed special. After the eve of the Starfall, the mood in Smallville changed. It was always a warm, happy town, but now this strange shared secret seemed to unite people even more. To call Smallville a cult would be unfair, but only a little. But Clark Kent was not the only miracle baby that year. As the sky turned green and streaks of fire began impacting cornfields, Abigail was on her way home and was forced to swerve into a cornfield. She smashed over an embankment and gave birth half a month early from trauma. Her son, Peter Ross, was born at 4 a.m., stone dead. The doctors performed CPR on him, and somehow this infant was able to will himself back to life. As much as Clark Kent was like a kind of local Harry Potter type celebrity, like, hey, that's that kid who something is, it's weird. Pete Ross was like, also that. And Pete was way more outgoing and way more extroverted, and Clark was kind of this, like, sullen little grump, and Pete was like, dude, you're invincible, let's go! He would play a game with Clark where he would strap himself to Clark, and Clark would go and run and get in the tornado and get picked up and then have to blast things away as they flew at Pete, and of course, Pete would be, like, taking selfies with a Polaroid camera, having the time of his life as Clark was screaming. I don't even want to get into all the crazy hijinks these two kids got up. If your best friend can get drunk but not wasted and he can also fly, he can get high but he will never fall asleep from weed, he can get bonked and he'll go ow but he can't actually be harmed. If you are Pete Ross and your personality is <laughs> let's drink a beer and let me throw you off a cliff. I mean, Clark Kent is built. They're built for each other. Pete and Clark, if they had not grown up together, would have probably never been friends. But they grew up next to each other. And by the first time tornado season came around and Pete Ross was going, hey, Clark, you gotta listen to me. Clark had never experienced anything like this. In school, he was a shy outsider, but Pete wouldn't give up on being his friend. He was relentless. He was fascinated by Clark, not just because he had superpowers, but because Clark was his polar opposite. Pete loved that he could like bring this kid out and be like, hey, what's, what's happening inside that house? And Clark would be like, the people are making dinner and she's smoking a cigarette in the kitchen. Oh my God, she said she quit. We have to tell my mom and my mom will rat her out. So they were just like causing trouble in the town for six years of chaos as Clark's powers slowly emerged. It was like Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn. Except by high school, Clark was like not that shy anymore. He had actually stopped a crime, American Alien issue too, but had only done so with help from Pete. Clark was hard to hurt, but it turned out he wasn't invincible. And being violent in the way he is in American Alien issue two was terrifying for him. He had like PTSD. He got shot in the face. He's 15 years old. Pete, however, saw it differently. Clark's ability to protect the family that he saved from a group of drug-addled loners really made an impression on Pete Ross. He started asking, Clark, how do you still just want to be a veterinarian? Like, you're like, a super strong alien messiah figure, maybe? You know, Pete Ross at this point had gotten really into Bukowski and like, have you ever read Kafka? P Pete Ross became really insufferable when he was like 17 because of a small town, big personality, you know, not great. But Pete began to kind of resent Clark. I mean, Clark got to go on this crazy adventure on Bruce Wayne's yacht and all this crazy fun adventures. Clark would leave the town and fly all over and not land and not take Pete. Clark was like, I'll fly y'all around. We'll have this wonderful backpacking adventure in Europe. Yeah, that never happened because Clark got into a good college where he made new friends and Pete didn't get into anywhere he applied and he stayed in Smallville. Pete's father at this point was trying to get a fishing 
business set up in Florida, except it just was not working and it was a bad investment and they started losing a lot of money and then Pete's parents got divorced. So now Pete is 20 and still in Smallville. Both parents leave Smallville and Pete is left in the Ross farm alone. Clark was basically Pete's, you know, when you find someone and you're like, Gazunka, you know, you're just in with them, that's your homie. Like that was his one person in the town who he was at that level with, those real long talks, sitting and talking with your friend level. I mean, there was like Kenny Braverman, like a couple other people, but like at the end of the day, not really. Pete Ross is a very smart, outgoing, super willful, kind of like extroverted guy. He's not the type of dude who's just going to stay and run on a farm forever. He had dreams when he was little that he would be an astronaut because, I mean, he knew an alien. He would eventually probably have to go to space, right? That was his dream. And now he was 22. And now he was 24. And Clark was on TV as something called Mr. Metropolis. Pete was horrified by the emergence of Superman. He didn't get it. He kept trying to call Clark. He was like, you have a career. You have a life. Why are you doing this to your parents? You know, you're, you're fighting criminals. You're putting yourself in danger. This is weird and scary. Don't do this. But Clark at that point had gotten really passionate about it. And he was like, Pete, you don't understand. There's this guy, Batman, there's other ones. And someone needs to be the line between these guys and normal people, man because otherwise we're all fucked. Pete was like, no. Okay, then if you're gonna do that, be that. Take it, talk on TV, explain what's going on, Clark. Don't just fly in and save people. No one knows who you are. Clark's star just continued to rise. And by the time Kenny and Pete visit Clark in American Alien issue six, I mean, Superman is an international celebrity. At this point, Pete like has been through like three different relationships. He's kind of getting more committed to Lana Lang, who was Clark's like teen girlfriend, but she never left the town and she's just sort of a single mom and Pete's sort of in her life now a little bit. They live at the barn now and Pete's like kind of taking care of them, but they don't fuck. So like, He's like in a relationship with her, but it's totally empty because Pete can't seem to get his will going to will himself the way he willed himself back to life. He's not willing himself into the next stage of his life. He's just festering in a farm. He reconnects with Clark in Metropolis and read American Alien issue six, basically goes, Hey, motherfucker, you can't just casually be Superman. It's time to start taking responsibility for yourself and figuring it all out. That reconnection between the two guys, it, it helped Clark so much emotionally because he had felt in Metropolis increasingly like he was in the closet, like Luther was going to find and kill him, like the walls were closing in. Clark was losing his connection to Clark Kent and slowly being dominated by his job and Superman. Pete helped Clark reconnect with himself, but then went back and married Lana Lang all alone by himself, by sheer force of will. Pete rehabs the entire farm. He gets it back to being gorgeous and it becomes a luxury rental. Holy shit, it's back to where we were. He's fulfilling the legacy of his parents and oh man, Pete hates it. He just forces himself to do it because he doesn't know what he's supposed to be doing. And now his best friend is Superman. So maybe his job is just to support him. Except for after like a year, Clark stops returning texts and you know, it's once a week, it's like, hey man, how are you doing? And he's like, oh, it's okay. And when they talk on the phone, it's okay. But Pete doesn't actually reconnect with Clark until Superman, agent of Batman, when Bruce Wayne, the Batman, manipulates Pete by getting his dad's old fishing boat and using that to be the thing that Clark uses to go find Aquaman. Watch Superman, agent of Batman. All you need to know is the two guys reconnect in a major way. And Pete, who's now going through a divorce with Lana Lang, who, by the way, got the barn in the divorce. Pete Ross, man. 
Oof. So he's lost everything. Pete moves to Metropolis, where he is hired by Oliver Queen. Now, I want to talk to you about Oliver Queen and Pete, because... They are very different guys and they are very threatened by each other because Oliver Queen's masculinity is sort of like, hey, I'm a sexy guy, blah, 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 blah. Some people think I'm gay. You know, that that sort of thing. That sort of like smooth, silly Russell Brand guy. And Pete, you know, Pete Ross is sort of, he's sort of in here and he's, he's funny and he's outgoing, but he's a real guys guy. He doesn't like, he's, I'm not big in sports. I don't care about sports. I like business. I like stocks, but I don't do good at stocks, so... I like him though. You know, I, I don't think you have to be a great fighter to like getting hit in the face. Or at least uh, I'm starting to think I'm a bit of a masochist, but I'm still trying though. The dynamic of like a feat billionaire and like really depressed small town jock, former popular guy at first is hard and then it's not. Pete and Oliver love each other. They easily get along better than Oliver and Clark because Oliver and Clark no matter how friendly they are, and they do grow to really care about each other, there's always sort of this wall because Oliver sort of thinks Clark is a sucker. Like, he's a, he's a socialist, and he's all for, like, helping the people and being great, but he kind of thinks, like, come on, man. You're, this is the way you are. Like, Clark Kent, this is you. I want to be, I want to be Superman to help the people. I just want to, I thought I was just going to save cats. Pete feels exactly the same way about Clark. So almost immediately once Pete starts working for Oliver, this dynamic develops where just when they're together, they just double team Clark mercilessly and he can barely fucking verbally fight back. It's a mess. Pete ends up being made liaison to all of the metahumans who are emerging to actually get into Oliver Queen's various programs for metahumans, with the society being the number one sort of like flagship program. We're, we're the superheroes of the world. Hey, you're scared of Luther's Justice League, which is like murdering terrorists and dictators with impunity all over the world? Well, you have weird superpowers, something weird happened to you, why don't you come join us? Pete has a little bit of hospitality background and a little bit of engineering background, but what Pete really has is unlimited work ethic. And his first project, the first person to actually show up is a guy named Rudy Jones. Rudy Jones actually appears in American Alien issue five. Uh, he gets his own page because he becomes a monster called the Parasite. Rudy Jones was a homeless addict, a former baseball player whose life fell apart after he got very, very into heroin and he ended up volunteering for a sketchy experimental program at LexCorp uh, run by a guy named Kirk Langstrom where he was fucked with genetically and he became this thing that can absorb energy. Now, Rudy didn't know that it was LexCore that did this. I'm telling you that because it'll make more sense later when I do better videos that are cooler if you know that now. Luther had basically chewed this guy up and spit him out. After Clark had defeated the parasite and thrown Rudy Jones into Luther's office only to get backtalked by Luther in American Alien issue 5, Luther flushed him and tried to kill him. He buried the dude in cement and only by slowly draining cell phone batteries over the course of four years from under cement was Rudy Jones able to free himself. The thing is, Rudy Jones is not an asshole. He's not even a bad guy. He has some real serious emotional problems from a life of trauma and addiction, but he is not a bad guy. So the first thing he did when he freed himself was immediately went to Queen and said, fucking help me. I'm one of these superheroes, but I don't want to be this. Pete Ross, working with Rudy over the course of eight months, was able to, number one, get this guy's head together after four years encased in concrete. Number two, most importantly, give this guy's life purpose. Pete Ross invented the idea of a company called the Super Friends. The Super Friends was an ongoing joke between the society, the team of heroes built by Oliver Queen, Edward Nigma, and Clark Kent. Motorcycle. But now Pete was like, no, listen to me, Clark, this is how we do it. We're alone out. Charities and projects all over the world, humanitarian, ecological projects, projects having to do with disaster relief, can literally fill out a form on a website and we can send someone to help them. Clark, would you be willing to do this? Would Arthur be willing to do this? Remember Arthur, the Aquaman, an eight foot tall monster who believes he's a god? 
Well, Pete and him fucking love each other too. Pete has an incredibly weird and close relationship with Aquaman because for Arthur, Arthur fought Clark and won. And then he kind of fought Dick Grayson, Robin and won. And then got wanged in the face by Pete Ross. So Arthur like really respects Pete and thinks he's like brave and cool and they go fishing together and Pete like is very invested in Arthur's life and backstory which I can't tell you about because it's in the animated movie I'm making of all this and I don't want to ruin it. But so Pete was able to convince not only Rudy but also Zatanna and fucking Aquaman to be part of a group called the Super Friends, which spent a full year where there were almost no supervillain incidents going all over the world helping people. That's Pete. Pete did that. Pete Ross changed the world. At no point in Pete's life did he feel secondary to Clark Kent. He was never made to feel small by Superman and never allowed himself to feel anything less than an equal to his best friend. This attitude allowed him to be an effective liaison to Diana of Troy, the Wonder Woman. Pete was now part of the society and a full-time businessman working with the Super Friends. This is basically from JSA Toy Man to the end of Superman for all mankind. So Pete really is ingrained in this story. At many of the big moments I've talked about, Pete Ross is somewhere. It really will help you if when I tell these Kryptonian epic stories, because I'm doing them out of order and like this Pete Ross video, I'm not telling you where Pete Ross and Diana go. And I'm not gonna tell you, uh, you know, what Pete Ross's fate is or if it all works out good for him. I will, however, give you a rare glimpse behind the curtain of the Kryptonian epic. It is so important to me that Clark Kent has a best friend he can be open with. And I think as Superman, it would be incredibly hard to make a new close friend. I mean, even most of the people Clark meets who end up becoming close to him, like Ted Kord or Zatanna, he's not wearing the Superman costume when he does that. And the way he met Bruce Wayne was like actually traumatic for Clark. Having Pete as a presence that weaves through American Alien and then is back in Agent of Batman becomes steadily more important in Superman Do It Yourself. Holy shit, JSA, Toy Man, Pete Ross is part of the fucking company, Superman for All Mankind, the Super Friends, we help people. And then of course his confrontation with Diana, which uh, you can uh, see in the tragedy of Wonder Woman. But now we've caught up to the end of Superman for All Mankind. The one thing I haven't shown you is the fear gas trip between Clark Kent and Bruce Wayne. Or is it Bane? Or is it Batman? Which is a very high production value video that's gonna be really crazy and I'm working really hard on. I know there's been like long breaks between this. The Kryptonian epic saved my life during the pandemic and I will finish it. And this animated movie will be sick and some of the stuff I'm gonna put out is gonna be sick. And I'm sorry, but you're gonna have to wait for it because I, I've just been feeling as as the you know as things open back up, I've just been feeling like I want to do so many different things. Uh, but the Kryptonian epic will be completed. Also, just from a mental standpoint, I've said this again and again. Think of it like Game of Thrones. It has a beginning, a middle, and the end. The stories you haven't heard that you need to hear, there are a bunch of them, but the main ones I would say are Aquaman at the Depths of Madness, Z the Magical Girl, The Society, uh, Endangered Species, which I'm gonna do a big video for. I'm gonna do The Death of Batman, which is from uh, Superman for, uh, for All Mankind, but I already shot that, that's a scarecrow and stuff. And then The Starlight Emperor and Whatever Happened to the Man of Tomorrow, I'm going to save those and I'm going to do pitch videos after the release of the animated film because there's a lot of spoilers in there. Basically right now, imagine if I was pitching you all of Game of Thrones, the whole series of Game of Thrones, but I never mentioned any of the scenes with the White Walkers. You know how they're in it from the very beginning? Well, there's something in this from the very beginning too. Three lights hanging in darkness. A general from a planet with no soldiers and something hungry and ferocious that can never be sated until an entire planet lies in ruin before it.
It's going to be cool, guys. Kryptonian Epic. I'm sorry for the long break.